So Swatch just announced its latest partnership with Omega for the Moon Swatch, and this time they've poked us all right in the childhood. This is the Snoopy Mission to the Moon Phase Moon Swatch. Swatch has realised that if you want people to listen, you can't just tap them on the shoulder anymore. You have to hit them with a sledgehammer, and then you'll notice you've got their strict attention. But is the Mission to the Moon Phase the new messiah, or a t-shirt at best? Envy. It all begins at the beginning, when Omega took revenge on Rolex for showing it up completely with the Submariner. Whilst Omega was playing house with its supposed Seamaster, barely resistant to dust and moisture, Rolex was busy getting its feet wet. And its torso, and its head, and about 98 more metres of sea above that too. The 1957 Speedmaster wasn't just a warning shot, it was 200 tonnes of TNT fired straight up Rolex's Jaxi. You might know that the chronograph has been a historic Achilles heel for Rolex, and that's because when Omega went hard on it, it went harder than an armour-piercing bullet train. They were methodical, exacting, and worst of all, patient. It was a new concept. The chronograph up until then was a timid creature, small, delicate, and dainty. Omega had the idea that when speed was involved, for the measurement of which a chronograph was needed, ferocious energy would come too, and so the Speedmaster would need to be built a little more robust than Nana's doily. It was big, it was chunky, and it redefined the chronograph, bringing it in line with the dive watch in its functional resilience. The tachymeter scale, used for measuring, amongst other things, speed, was shifted from the dial to the bezel as a statement of intent, which in turn acted like a shield around the watch to protect the complex mechanism within. Realising the game had moved on, others would soon copy Omega, like Rolex with the Daytona and Hoya with the Carrera, both in 1963. But it was all too late by then, because the year before, astronaut Walter Schirrer had already worn a Speedmaster in space. It was his own personal watch, and would no doubt have an influence on NASA when it chose the official chronograph of the space race. By 1965, Omega not only had another Speedmaster worn in space, on the wrist of Ed White during the first American spacewalk, it had also achieved what has become the envy of every other watch brand. It had become flight qualified by NASA for all manned space missions. Rolex may have conquered the sea and the air, but Omega had space. And things only got better from there. The first watch worn on the moon, the first watch driven on the moon during Apollo 15 and the introduction of the lunar rover, where the Speedmaster was used as it was originally intended. And of course the watch that saved the Apollo 13 crew and would go on to win the Snoopy Award that would set all this in motion. Pride. Have you ever stopped to ask yourself, why Snoopy? How on earth did this lazy little beagle end up as the poster child not just of Omega, but like, well, the whole of NASA as well? Well, let's go back to 1947, to the Howdy Doody Show, a children's TV program filmed live in front of an audience of delightful little brats. Said brats were housed in the peanut gallery, with the implication being that the children themselves were the peanuts. And so, in 1950, seven years before the arrival of the first Speedmaster, was penned the inaugural instalment of the everyday adventures of a group of children and their dog, Snoopy. It was, of course, called Peanuts, and was the brainchild of Charles M. Schultz. Schultz's artistic career started with a whimper, his drawings rejected for his high school yearbook. That's up there with Dick Rowe of Decca Records turning down the Beatles because guitar groups are on their way out. After a time fighting in World War II, Schultz returned to the US to learn cartooning at the school Art Instruction Inc., where he also had a job grading students work to make ends meet. It was around this time he developed a one-panel comic called Lil Folks, where Charlie Brown would make his first appearance. There was even a dog that looked a lot like you-know-who. No, not Voldemort. Snoopy. Schultz offered Lil Folks around with hints of opportunity here and there, but it was United Feature Syndicate that took the leap. For legal reasons, they scrapped the name Lil Folks and substituted their own. Peanuts. They also wanted four panels per comic and not one, which was great because Schultz would get paid four times as much. Peanuts' first appearance, across seven newspapers, was on October 2nd, 1950. The success Peanuts would go on to have is indisputable, but even then the numbers hardly seem real. People will barely be able to comprehend it, but they won't be able to deny it. In his lifetime, Schultz drew no less than 17,897 comic strips. It ran over 2,600 newspapers across 75 countries and was read by 355 
million. The most insane thing is that Schultz drew every single strip himself by hand with no assistance, including the lettering and colouring. He only took one break in 50 years to celebrate his 75th birthday. Why was Peanuts so successful? Simply because it was relatable to virtually everyone. Charlie Brown is quiet and nervous, his life is humdrum, his friends range from arrogant to affable, and of course his dog is lazy. And boy did that lazy little dog capture the hearts and minds of a nation. The entire comic was a work of subtlety and nuance that spanned philosophy, sociology and psychology in its pithy sentiment. After decades of propaganda and fake smiles, Peanuts brought a dash of indulgent cynicism that found an affinity with millions upon millions. Right from the very first strip, which depicts a child acknowledging good old Charlie Brown, only to admit that he hates good old Charlie Brown, Peanuts introduced a grounded take that explored the imperfect reality of people. Schultz changed the way humour could be perceived, with many legendary cartoonists since, including Jim Davis, Matt Groening and Bill Waterson, crediting him directly as their influence. Schultz. So far, two very isolated tales that have about as much in common as a carrot and a car park, yet here we are over half a century later with the two intertwined so tight they could be symbiotic. How does a small belligerent dog from a 50s cartoon end up on a cheap alternative to the watch that went to the moon? The space race is one that came to be pretty much of its own volition. At the end of the Second World War, scientists and engineers on both sides were experimenting with a new kind of weapon, one that could be fired from a great distance away and carry an enormous payload, the rocket. The war was a time of huge technical development, with other breakthroughs including the jet engine and of course the atomic bomb. American superiority had been cemented with Oppenheimer's creation, and as he predicted, it started an arms race to develop the most powerful weapon ever built. The combination of the global reach of rockets with the almighty devastation of a nuclear bomb became the number one priority for every superpower. The political tide turned quickly. Russia, an ally in World War II, went head-on with America in this arms race, whilst Germany, once an enemy, became the source of America's success through one Werner von Braun. Von Braun had developed the V-2 ballistic missile for the German military, but as the war came to a close, he surrendered to the Americans. He was relocated to Texas, where he worked with a group of 125 on Project Paperclip, developing rocket technology. The launch of Sputnik 1, the first artificial Earth satellite by the Russians in 1957, caused Eisenhower to quickly move von Braun's rocket development program from the Army to a new organization, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA. Von Braun would go on to head up NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center and begin his most challenging project yet, building the Saturn V rocket, a vehicle with enough power to take man to the moon. Kennedy had, in light of the Russians beating America to the first man in space and first spacewalk, raised the bar to an almost impossible height. Here was the problem. The Apollo program would cost in today's money $250 billion. That's the GDP of New Zealand. How would it be possible to persuade an American public that this endeavour was worth such enormous sacrifice? The hard way would have been through education, empowering millions of Americans to make the decision as to whether the space race was right or wrong. The easy way, the lazy way, was to recruit the most beloved cartoon character in the world. Al Chop, Deputy Public Affairs Officer at what is now known as the Johnson Space Center, had the idea to reach out to Schultz to see if Olympic skier, hockey star and World War I fighter ace Snoopy would like to join the ranks of NASA. Initially, this was as part of an internal safety campaign following the deaths of three astronauts, but Schultz was so thrilled to be part of the program that Snoopy very quickly found himself becoming a public ambassador in peanut strips as well. Snoopy hit such a strong chord inside NASA that he was incorporated into almost everything. The instruction booklets used by the astronauts through mission critical procedures featured Snoopy cartoons in them. The lunar lander was christened Snoopy. There was even a moon crater named after the little pub. One constant would become the silver pin badges worn by the astronauts that featured Snoopy in a little spacesuit. Those badges have flown on Apollo to the moon, been worn on the International Space Station, ridden aboard the Space Shuttle, and even caught a ride on Artemis 1, NASA's first return to lunar orbit in half a century. 
Those mission-flown silver pin badges are awarded to those on the ground that have contributed to the safety of a mission in an exceptional way. And for Omega, theirs was earned in April of 1970, when the crew of Apollo 13 almost became the first Americans to die in space. The mission was aborted when an oxygen tank ruptured and set them on a course that would not return them home safely. Several critical burns were timed with an Omega watch to bring the crew back, and for that, Omega was awarded a Silver Snoopy. The Silver Snoopy Award has featured on three Omega Speedmasters up to now, four including this swatch, with the first arriving in 2003, a simple, ordinary Speedmaster with the Snoopy Award patch appearing on the running second subdial and on the case bag. The second came in 2015, this time with a white dial and a reference to the 14 second engine burn timed by an Omega, and the most recent in 2020, which added a contrasting blue and an animated case back depicting Snoopy's adventures in space. List. The last manned mission to the moon was in December 1972, Apollo 17. Apollo 18 had been cancelled due to lack of money. The Cold War with Russia was easing. The American public, even with Snoopy's best efforts, were becoming restless. The love affair with space was officially over. This also coincided with the end of another institution, the Mechanical Watch. Japanese quartz technology was quickly becoming smaller, more accurate and cheaper than mechanical, and so the buying public made the jump. Thousands of Swiss watch manufacturers went under, and it was looking like the tide had turned on the dominant superpower of the timekeeping industry. That is until Ernst Tomke, Elmer Mock and Jacques Muller had an idea. They too would create a cheap watch, but rather than it being a serious chronometer of the likes the Swiss reputation had been built on, it would be silly and fun. A second watch. A swatch. Sales in the first year numbered in the millions. The Swatch watch was so successful that, under the leadership of entrepreneur Nicholas Hayek, it would go on to buy many of the once great watch brands that had dominated in the time before Quartz. Legends like Breguet, Blancpain and of course, Omega. It would become the Swatch Group, the world's largest watchmaking group. Almost half a century on, that group was looking to make another splash. It was post-lockdown, people were raring and ready to get back outside again, and so came the lunatic idea to take all the history we've just covered and package it up into a little plastic toy for 300 bucks. The Moonswatch, launched on the 26th of March 2022, committed the cardinal sin of branding, crossing the streams. It's so important to watch brands to preserve the value of the most prestigious over some of the less so, that groups go so far as to dictate which are allowed to be presented alongside each other, in which shops, and on which shelves. The Moonswatch, however, did away with that conventionality and combined the group's cheapest brand with one of its most prestigious into a likeness of perhaps the most well-recognized and decorated watches in the world, the Speedmaster. It came in 11 flavors, each related to a different solar body, and the reception was… frenetic. From day one, there were queues around the block as a cleverly curated teaser campaign seeped into the hype sphere that had been surrounding the sneaker market for many years prior. The Moonswatch, a little plastic nod to Omega's $10,000 chronograph, had become an investment. From the word go, it was appearing for sale a factor of 10 over list, with the irony being that the prices entertained could have secured an actual moonwatch. Wrists were being stained blue, pushers were dropping like flies, scratches appeared almost as if by magic, but people didn't care. They wanted the moonswatch so bad. It was perhaps the biggest shift in the watch zeitgeist since the Swatch Watch had first been announced. And when the Moon Swatch was announced, it was just ahead of the biggest watch show in the world. And in the surroundings of the latest Rolexes and Patek Philippe's, all anyone could talk about was this little plastic watch. According to Hayek, the Moon Swatch sold over a million units in that first year, and boosted sales of the original Moon Watch by 50%. It was such a shock to the system that even a couple of years on, enthusiasts are still undecided as to what to make of it. On the one hand, it's a poorly made, cheap imitation of a great watch, and on the other, it's a fun, affordable take on the historic legend. There are more Moon Swatches in the collections of die-hard watch fans than perhaps they'd like to admit. I just don't think I can continue to live in a place that embraces and nurtures apathy as if it was virtue. I have to admit, the Moon Swatch, for all its faults, was a breath of fresh air. It brought people together. Rich or poor, the Moon Swatch was attainable, at least in the general scheme of luxury watches. And that's something Swatch was very keen to capitalise on. Great. 
As the 11 moon swatches became more available, Swatch was keen to draw out the tale of its success, particularly in the visual aspect, the long snaking queues into the streets. From the very beginning, Swatch had insisted the Moon Swatch would be an in-person purchase only, to bring the community together, or rather to keep the hype train chugging along up the track. There was a brief intimation at the beginning that the Moon Swatch would be available online, but that got cold the instant Swatch realised they had a hit the size of the moon on their hands. So came the limited editions, special versions of the existing watches with tweaked gold-plated seconds hands available in certain locations on full moons only. It was like a cross between Carmen San Diego and Twilight, but nerdier. Rehashing the same thing could only go so far, however, and like fans waiting for the next Tool album, people started getting restless. This particular part of the story, however, isn't going to have a happy ending. Remember I said the Swatch Group owned other great brands like Breguet and Blancpain? Well, given the success of the Moon Swatch in driving sales to the Moon Watch, there could only be one possible outcome. Another legacy Swatch Group brand would get the Swatch treatment. And it did, the Blancpain 50 Fathoms, a watch that designed the blueprint for the modern dive watch. So Swatch Swatchified the 50 Fathoms, releasing a series of plastic versions based on the five different oceans and the gloopy critters that reside within them. Whilst day one there were once again queues to buy the 50 Fathoms, the hype was just nowhere near the same. Several things had gone wrong. The first was the price. In giving the 50 Fathoms an automatic movement instead of a quartz, albeit a particularly crappy automatic movement, the price had crept out of the impulse purchase and into the considered. Second was the fact that it was too big, just like the original. Third were the colour schemes, which offered bold choices but nothing neutral, despite the neutral moon swatches being the most popular. They would go on to try and fix this with the all-black Ocean of Storms edition. But lastly, and although silly I think most important, the 50 Fathoms didn't have a fun name. Moonswatch is fun, it works, but 50 Fathoms is just the name of the original watch, and so to clarify you have to say Blanc Pan Time Swatch 50 Fathoms, and now it's boring and I don't want one. And that was kind of it for the Blanc Pan Time Swatch 50 Fathoms. It fizzled out like past gas in the Pacific. With cynical dread over this once fun idea, we collectively wondered what icon of horology would be turned into canned cheese by Swatch next, how many times Breguet would turn over in his grave, and in what contrived way they would channel their inner Frankenstein to pull it all together. What actually happened, I don't think anyone expected. I want to take a sidebar just for a minute to add something else to the mix. It will be relevant. During the time of Snoopy and the Apollo missions, another odd dog-related mystery started raising questions. If you were to take a walk around your neighbourhood and keep your eyes on the ground, you'd see something a little… unusual. Small, chalky nuggets. Little, pale pellets. I'm talking about white dog poo. You used to see it all the time, but now it's gone. It would lie there, caught up in that little scrub of grass that grows up from the edge between the footpath and the fence, or like, the only reason I'm here right now is that I wanted to be. No, we weren't seeing how organic blackboard chalk was made, it was all down to a wave of bargain dog food hitting the market, packed with cheap fillers that were high in bone and went straight on through like it had a police escort. Eventually, customers got wise that they were paying for waste and the material was no longer used. So ended an era, until now. Yes. For the last few weeks, Omega's teased us with hints of Snoopy, preparing once again, like it did in 2022, to release something just ahead of the world's biggest watch show. And we've been frantically asking over and over, what's in the box? What's in the box? Well, now we know. It's the mission to the moon face Snoopy times Omega times Swatch. It follows on four years after the Omega Silver Snoopy Award and two years from the original Moon Swatch. And it looks like that lazy little dog has done it again. This one's got people's attention, so let's take a look and see why. Most noticeable is the colour, a monochromatic chalky white. It's nostalgic. Takes us back to the era of the Apollo 13 mission that earned Omega the Snoopy Award in the first place. At a glance, everything else appears to be the same. There's no Snoopy patch like the Omega watches. Instead, on the 2 o'clock subdial is a tiny moon phase display, which covers off the 29 and a half day cycle of the moon. And perched on the moon, lazy as ever, is Snoopy, along with his little bird pal Woodstock. On the back is a Peanuts-esque depiction of the moon with a paw print just off-centre. 
And if you shine an ultraviolet light on the watch, the moon and stars will glow, along with the line, I can't sleep without a nightlight. This is a reference to a peanut strip where Snoopy can't sleep in his dark kennel, so he climbs on top to lay out flat on his back, using what else for his nightlight but of course the full moon. To be honest, there's no explaining why this will be successful. It just will. Explaining that is like explaining why Peanuts and Snoopy touched the world in the way they did. It's just intrinsic, hopeful. And it's a time that people need hope more than ever. With NASA returning to the moon and exploring new opportunities to bring a bright future back to Earth, there's something about this stupid plastic bit of white dog sh** that's somehow reassuring. Ernest Hemingway once wrote, The world is a fine place and worth fighting for. Thank you so much for watching. What's your take on the mission to Snoopy Moonswatch Moon Phase to the Moon, and will you be attempting to get one? I might. I don't know. In the meantime, I'll be discussing it over with my Patreons, and I'd love it if you joined us. Anyway, until next time. And if you can't get hold of a Snoopy Moonswatch, just take one from a child instead. They're super weak, and it'll be really easy. Goodbye.